technology, right? Yeah. <laughs> there is supposed to be a whale sound, but can anybody, if you imagine you heard a really, really loud whale noise, do you think you all would be able to tell me what that whale just said? I didn't think so. So a nonprofit Earth Species Project is currently developing AI models that can decode animal communication. And to us, this is a prime example of how AI is pushing the limits of human ability. As humans, we're controlled by our curiosity and drive to understand the world around us. And we've seen that we're willing to use just about any tool to do that. From, you know, uh, from cave paintings and early architectural equipment uh, to water sensors and iPhones, we have an urge to not just observe, but gain deep insights about the world around us. And so similar to the dawning of the internet or even the COVID-19 pandemic, AI is literally redefining how we interact with the world. But at the same time, it's reinforcing the status quo and some of our more jaded ways of thinking. So I know that conversations about AI in the mainstream media seem new, but uh, the idea of artificial intelligence actually dates back thousands of years to ancient philosophers pondering questions of life and death. Inventors in ancient times made things called automatons, which were machine-like devices that could move independently of human intervention. And the word automaton is a Greek ancient word meaning acting of one's own will. But let's get specific for a second. We're here to not just talk about how AI, but generative AI is redefining the ways that we interact with the world. When we think about things like Siri, Alexa, or a chatbot on any website, those are forms of AI that we're already familiar with, or that we may have not even realized are AI. But tools like ChatGPT, Bard, and Dolly are doing things that scientists only dreamed of. They're literally generating new possibilities for our world. So how are they doing that? Well, their programs use massive amounts of data and run on servers that need huge amounts of water and electricity. Google alone used five billion gallons of fresh water to cool their AI servers last year. And in 2026, it's estimated that data centers around the world will consume as much energy as Japan each year. So how do we reckon with that reality, that these AI tools are influencing our world, changing the way that we do things, and will hopefully potentially change the, the nature of humans? When we look at the discourse around AI, we hear the noise of much unwarranted pessimism, the ones that we get from some sci-fi movies, think Skynet from Terminator scenarios. But when we take a more grounded approach, when we think about environmental costs, when we think about disproportionate distribution of innovation wealth, or when we think about mindless automation practices, we see that these tools not only reflect our broken humanity, but often amplify global complexities. Their shortcomings create an ecosystem of rapid innovation that predominantly caters to the historically privileged subset of the world and lacks regulation to rectify the inequity. So as members of the AI community, how do we move forward? And speaking of rapid innovation, uh, giants like P&G and Fidelity and almost every Fortune 500 company is investing in creating their own large language model for chatbots, just like ChatGPT. Organizations like Facebook and LinkedIn are using AI on a daily to assist with content moderation, personalizing your user feeds, and even people matching algorithms. The skill set of a workforce is rapidly changing. And with the surge in this AI usage, research community is probably as split as this room if I were to ask you all your opinions about pineapple and pizza. Some researchers have compared the AI trends to snake oils, and some researchers have not hesitated in calling it a revolution. So let's learn a little more about these tools. What is generative AI? A lot of these tools are created like a cognitive system. It uses code to emulate the human brain to learn, understand, and interact with the world in human-like ways. But just like any cognitive system, whether organic, like us, or artificial, there are biases that need to be dealt with. 
And the unchecked deployment of these biases in sensitive areas like law enforcement, healthcare diagnostics, recruitment processes, and even financial lending practices create some dangerous scenarios for humanity at large. And we've seen some of these failures in the failures of mega corporations. For example, in 2017, Google's Allo algorithm recommended a man wearing a turban emoji as one of the responses for a gun emoji. Not only that, think, take the case of a healthcare algorithm that specifically recommended white patients over black patients for a care management program. These are not isolated, singular instances. These are systemic failures. And these systemic failures end up creating an aversion to AI technologies within our local communities. Fueled by fear-mongering and disinformation, that aversion quickly turns into hysteria. So one of our mentors, Professor Jeff Schaefer here at UC, investigated the general perceptions about AI at the University of Cincinnati. And he found that the UC community was most concerned with issues of dependency, complexity, and privacy issues when it was related to ChatGPT. Even a survey from EY found that 71% of employees in our workforce hold some kind of AI anxiety, and that spans from job displacement to ethical use of AI. So luckily, these anxieties are rooted in real issues and not the bots taking over the world narrative. And so I think that people really understand that as we shape our tools, our tools shape our society. And that can be scary. So how do we deal with those anxieties? Well, inclusive research design shows us that intentionality is key in creating products that can cater to a wide range of individuals. But it's clear that that understanding isn't trickling down to a grassroots level, and that affects local establishments like your local mom and pop store or uh, the farmer's market you know, just down the street from you. How are these people being impacted by these new technologies? And as we investigate, um, as we investigate how these technologies are impacting those people, it raises two fundamental questions for us. Are these groups being ex deliberately excluded from these conversations due to capitalistic motivations of in innovation, AKA trying to make the most money possible? Or is there hysteria and fear mongering that's making these groups averse to using these technologies in a meaningful way and benefiting from it the most? So we tried to find out by engaging directly with these groups. We interviewed political advocacy and nonprofit community members, and then we sent out surveys to small business owners in the Cincinnati area. And our results, specifically from working directly with vendors at Finley Market, were really intriguing. Over 60% of the respondents to our survey said that they're not using generative AI at all in their businesses. And almost none of them said that they plan to use AI in crucial areas like innovation, decision making, and data analysis. Um, and as we investigated some of those apprehensions further, we found that one of the main barriers to using a generative AI tool, of course, was lack of expertise. Um, and as we even found that a lot of our respondents had huge ethical concerns related to lack of accountability and legal liability, as well as issues around data privacy for their businesses. And so as we interviewed these groups, we also found out that they've been approached by a lot of businesses who are already trying to sell them AI tools. But a lot of those businesses selling these tools are kind of using a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't really cater to the needs of these businesses. And as we talked to them, the idea of creating an AI tool that's made specifically for them seemed completely out of reach and unreasonable. And so it's clear that the groundwork isn't there for these short businesses to thrive and that they need guidance and education about how to use these tools. And so that brings us to our vision. We see a future where inclusive design incorporates that necessary guidance and education, but also includes our community in that intentional design process from the very beginning of the inception of a new generative AI tool. In the short term, we think of an AI toolkit designed specifically for each small business. Think of a one-stop shop where businesses can go and get information about marketing materials, inventory management, reimagining their storefronts, and even looking at customer analytics. The possibilities are endless. But we won't understand the shortcomings or 
the gaps that we need to fill unless community organizers, nonprofits, and even these small businesses start using these tools. We want AI to be net good for all, but for that to happen, we need to start right now. We need to understand the current concentration of usage within the AI tools that we have. Along with that, we need to create more sustainable tools that are built keeping in mind small businesses and their needs. So the first step for that is understanding and exposure. We need to make sure that our local communities are exposed to these tools to combat hysteria that comes with all the disinformation that's out there. As our research revealed, there is a deep sense of mistrust in using AI tools. But we found that there's also a sense of shame in using these tools. Specifically with small businesses, we found that a lot of business owners did not want to engage with these tools because they thought that their customers would think that they're being disingenuous or that they are cutting corners in their work or that they are trying to use AI when it should be done by humans. When we delved deeper into those results, we understood that this context needs a reevaluation of our approach when we're approaching small businesses. We need to reshape the narrative of AI is using AI means that you're cutting corners to thinking of it as a tool to access and tap into your creativity and opportunity. We also need to understand that to achieve this goal, we need to have broader conversation around AI ethics and the usage of it, not just at the larger institutional levels of how Kendall Jenner is being affected by the deep fakes that are out there, but at your local mom and shop at the grassroots levels. At the same time, we need to understand why there is a sense of guilt in these business owners when they use AI tools. Specifically, why is there a guilt for not handcrafting every single aspect of your business? I'm sure most of us in this, this morning had a cup of coffee before we got here, and I'm sure some of you used a coffee maker, and I'm sure some of you create, went out there, got your own coffee beans, and you know, made your own coffee from scratch. So if, why is that kind of, why is that feeling not translated when it comes to AI usage? Most of the businesses that we worked with also informed us that they are being approached by larger tech companies and are being overwhelmed with offers to integrate AI for their businesses. And given the mistrust and the shame that we saw, they don't know what to do with those offers. So that's where we come in. We want to create those meaningful paths to partnerships. But also, and more importantly, we want to create meaningful paths to empowerment for those businesses so they can do this work on their own rather than depending on some or outsourcing or depending on another agency. We want to go out there and ask them what they need and seek solutions for them rather than advertise products that weren't created for them in the first place. And that brings us to our long-term vision. In the long term, we envision our communities being at the forefront of the design research that goes into creating AI tools. And that requires transparency and accountability on the side of big tech companies and large corporations. So how do we do that? There's an easy solution, and that's government regulation. We need to ask the hard questions when it comes to government regulation. Where is the data being accessed from? How much of that data should companies be allowed to use? Who is responsible for those sometimes funny but unsettling celebrity deep fakes? And who's responsible when an AI model makes bad predictions? And what should these models be allowed to do in the first place? And we don't need to ask these questions at a high level or at an industrial level. We need to bring these conversations down to the grassroots level. How is it going to affect you and me and your favorite florist in Cincinnati? At the same time, and more importantly, we need to focus, we need to shift our focus away from the profit-driven incentives that govern our systems and center humanity and innovation. Not only that, we need to understand that these businesses that create, uh, that need the help of the tools and the large corporations that create the tools need a bridge in the middle so that they can work efficiently. So let's be that bridge. Let's be brave in demanding more from our government and these large corporations who often forget the power of our collective voice. Let's make sure that we use AI tools to help the ones on the margins 
rather than just reinforce the status quo. And let's rethink of ways that we can take our AI tools, not just as a way to be more efficient, but use it as a canvas for justice. In the beginning, we talked a little bit about sci-fi movies, right? And we saw that a lot of times sci-fi kind of inspires the fears that we have in our society. But more importantly, it also, but more importantly, it's an expression of our fears through art. So when we put our problems in new worlds and when we put our problems in new realities, we get the opportunity to think of more creative solutions than we would if we were to just experiment in real life. So let's do that. Let's lay the groundwork for the future of AI. And in turn, for the future of our humanity. Thank, Thank you. you.